Look at peak, look at that. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ من سر أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا لا فلا مضل لا ومن يضلل لا وأشهد لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شيء وأشهد أن محمدا نعب ورسوله أبا السلام عليكم ورحمة وبركاته الحمد لله we are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of continuing with our Ramadan tafsir and uh, Aminat schools, Islamic schools, masjid in Boso this uh, Saturday, 22nd day of Ramadan 1438 years after the hijrah of our noble prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam from Mecca to Medina. Allah today as usual we shall continue from where we stopped and uh, we are reading Surah to Al Imra. We have gotten up to the 151st verse of Surah to Al Imran. Inshallah ta'ala today we should start with um, the 150th corners of Surah Imran. Before we go on, I want to should I say ask a question? Today is the 22nd day of Ramadan. As is usual, we close the tafsir between 25th and 27th. Sometimes we close on the 25th, sometimes on the 26th, and sometimes on the 27th. So that means we have three more days after today from which we could close the tafsir. And so, and I, 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 I think we have a lot of questions on the ground. So what do we do? What do we do about the questions? We used to create days to answer just questions. I think we have done that just once or twice this year. And the rest of the days have been to see. Do we still dedicate them that will be able to answer most of the questions or be Which one is yes? Huh? I don't, I can't hear you. We should answer the questions. Huh? Okay. So how many days do we dedicate to the questions? Huh? Two days. Two days. Today and tomorrow when? Huh? Or we do tafsir today? You are not decided. Which one are you talking about? We answer the questions today and tomorrow? Today and tomorrow? Okay. If we are not able to finish the questions today and tomorrow, we just continue the tafsir? Huh? I will leave the questions. <laughs> okay, so let's see how, how many we can answer. I want to be able to have, we have scattered them now. I want them always to be in the order that they came. But you have scattered them. Huh? You have cut them, no longer going to be in that order, and I don't like that. It's not fair. Those whose questions come first should have answered first. Now you have jumbled them, we don't know which one. I don't like it when you do such manipulations. Look at me, I don't like it. I don't like it at all when you choose only the questions that appeal to you. Answer the questions as they and that's why you should leave them in the order that they came. I don't like it when you scatter them like this. Because it means you're going to be putting in your own interest in answering the question like that at all. So I, we won't answer today. So I'm going to do the tafsir. This person, new person, and he has not been trained on what we do and what we do not do. 
is making too many mistakes. Tala, do the tip. So the new questions that come, we will answer. These old ones, we will not answer. New questions come, please put them in their order. Maybe somebody else should do the work, but put them in their order. Don't jumble them. Any day I see that you're jumbling the question, not answer them. I don't like manipulations when you're giving trust. And the trust, hold it like that. As the questions come, leave them like that, put them in that order, and then let's answer them the way they come. One of the reasons the questions is to give people questions to answer. Sometimes they don't read the questions. They put in their interest and then form their own questions even though they tend to be read the questions. I don't like that kind of thing. Allow the things, if there are questions that you think are improper, you remove them. That is a different thing. But once you are bringing in the questions, let them be read as they have come. So, um, in the last verse we read, Allah says, That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised that he will throw fear into the minds of the kuffar who are fighting the Muslims. Bima ashraku, and this will be for the fact they are mushrikun, they have associated partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, malam yunazzil bihi sultana. That which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not revealed any evidence, that concerning which Allah has not revealed any evidence, they have associated partners with Allah. So when you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with evidences that are not from Allah, Neither are they from Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam, but just from your thinking or from your alim, it's a form of shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't engage in any act of worship unless it is clearly what Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam has taught. And you should be able to engage in that worship exactly as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam practiced it. So salat is an act of worship. If you want to perform salah, it has to be in accordance with the way that Rasul alayhi salatu uh, performed salah. So also if you want to fast, hajj is the thing and the rest of the acts of ibadah. They have to be in accordance with the practice of Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam. But you see something like maulid, you cannot practice it in accordance with the teachings of Rasul because he never practiced it. And so you can't copy from him. When people say, but Shaykh al-Islam said it is good, this person said it is good, this person said it's a good bid'ah, those ones were not sent to us. They are not our prophets. They are not perfect. They are imperfect people. They make mistakes and they can be right sometimes. So we don't worship them. We worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in accordance with the practice of Rasulullah And so if he is right, we hold on, I mean, if it comes from him, we hold on to it. And we engage in any act of worship exactly as the Prophet gave it. If we can't get any example from him, and somebody else says we should do it, we know, thank you, hold your thing, we will not do it. Therefore we leave it unto him, and we hold on to that which we can get example from. Uh, the sunnah of Rasul alayhi salatu wa For the mushrik, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala threw fear into their hearts because they associated partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even though they had no evidence concerning uh, their, their mode of work. So weakness became the trademark and Muslims had the over hand over, over them because the Muslims worship only Allah and only in accordance with the teachings of Rasul alayhi salatu wassalam. So in the third and the 152nd verse, Allah says, Hmm. Hmm. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَلَقَدْ صَدَقَكُمُ اللَّهُ وَعْدَهُ إِذْ تَحُسُّونَهُمْ إِذْ تَحُسُّونَهُمْ بِإِذْنِهِ حَتَّى إِذَا فَشِلْتُمْ وَتَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ وَعَصَيْتُمْ وَعَصَيْتُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا أَرَاكُمْ مَا تُحِبُّونَ مِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الدُّنْيَا وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الْآخِرَةَ وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الْآخِرَةَ ثُمَّ صَرَفَكُمْ عَنْهُمْ لِيَبْتَلِيَكُمْ وَلَقَدْ عَفَا عَنْكُمْ وَاللَّهُ ذُو فَضْلٍ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَلَقَدْ صَدَقَكُمُ اللَّهُ وَعْدَهُ This happened when Rasul alayhi salatu wassalam returned to Medina from the battle of Uhud. After they had been defeated, they had suffered defeat that they suffered as a result of the mistakes made by some people that were behind Abdullah ibn Jubair. Mm. After this had happened, some people from amongst the Sahaba said, but how is it that this happened to us? Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had promised us victory. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised us victory. So but then why did we go through defeat? Is the promise of Allah not true? Or what happened? Some sahaba were asking these questions. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse. So this is the sabab al-nuzul of this verse. So this verse is explaining what really happened. So it's important that Muslims know that sometimes what you see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell you that it is not so. Do you argue with him and say, how can you be telling me what I see when I know I have seen this and you say it's not so? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees as we do not see. And so it's possible for him to tell us a, th a thing which we can't immediately understand. What we do is we say, Sami'na wa ata'na as mu'minun. Because the reality will come to us later. We will understand soon that actually we saw it wrongly. Then in the beginning we may not see it that way. Whether we see it that way or not, we must always remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first and foremost, is not a human being. His knowledge is not as limited as ours. And then, of course, this brings us to the fact, secondly, that we should know that our own knowledge is limited. And so we shouldn't, we shouldn't at all believe at any time that what we think we know must be so. Sometimes we think this is what we see, but then after some time, after some experience, we discover that what we thought we saw was not exactly what we, we what, what uh, is not exactly what the reality is. So what we thought we saw is uh, contrary to what actually we saw. So our thought is one thing, the reality is another. Sometimes it is so, most times it is not so. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps telling us, وَمَا أُوتِيتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا What we have been given of ilm is little. As Muslims, we do not at any time believe that what we get to see is the only thing that exists. We don't believe that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, even though some of you are already doubting, you know, and uh, we shouldn't at all insult the Sahaba because some of them thought like that and we say, look at the people that you say Allah has forgiven. These people that sometimes they even doubt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they doubt Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam, is not so. 
the Sahaba were not perfect people. They made mistakes. We are also not perfect people. So we also make mistakes. If you don't forgive the mistakes of the Sahaba, do you want Allah to forgive your own mistakes? Huh? Even if you have power to forgive or not to forgive, you say they have made mistakes and you don't forgive them. So what happens to you, the mistakes that you have made? Do you want Allah to forgive them? You see, this is, uh, this, this is uh, one of the excesses of human beings, which happen mostly because you do not really stay to think. First of all, if the Sahaba made mistakes, it was between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah whom they offended says, I have forgiven them, what right do you have as a fellow human being to say you have not forgiven them? Whoever placed forgiving them in your hands? This is a big error. So, and secondly, thoughts like that occur to people. So even you sometimes, you're sitting and a, a thought will just occur to you. Who created Allah? Has that ever occurred to you? Huh? Say, but who created Allah? Where is He? How did He start? What brought Him about? Have questions like this ever occurred to you? Huh? Come on, don't pretend. I'm sure one, once, uh, once in a while they occur to you. Not only once. Sometimes they occur to you. you, know, now, you are, now you have the courage to say yes. Huh? You were hiding before. It occurs to almost every one of us. And Rasul والسلام, says, if they occur to you, there's a dua that you say. Who remembers the dua? Huh? Who remembers the dua? Even I have forgotten the dua. Who will remind me? Huh? It ends with Wa astaghfiru kalima la a'lam Or Wa astaghfiru kalima la a'lam Huh? Yes? Eh? A'udhu bika Wa ana a'lam Wa astaghfiruka Lima la a'lam Or lima la a'lam Which one did you see there? La, lima la a'lam So first of all, Allahumma Do you remember what he said now? Allahumma إني أعوذ بك أن أشرك أن أشرك أن أشرك بك فأنا أعلم Oh Allah, I seek your refuge from associating partners with you while I know وأستغفرك لما لا أعلم And I seek your forgiveness concerning that which has happened to me without my knowledge without my power you understand? So it's because of thoughts like that that occur to us. Sometimes a thought like that occurs to you. It's not that you sat down and form a thought. It just comes. And this is what comes. That's why what you do is, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika. Once you bring a'udhu bika, whether you call shaitan or not, the refuge you're seeking is from the sharr of the shaitan. That occurred to you. And that is why out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Because he knew that the Sahaba were true They were honest people When something like that occurred to them He would reveal a verse to explain the matter to them So that they will no longer be in confusion So it's the same thing we do If we have people that are confused like that we try as much as possible to give answers to their confusion. As much as we can, we give answers to their confusion. That's why some non-Muslims today, there are some of them who will be asking questions concerning Islam. For instance, one of them is raising an issue that Islam is a hypocritical religion. It encourages hypocrisy. It encourages you to hide what you feel and to show something else which you do not feel.
that this is deceptive, but that the Quran encourages us to do this. And they call it taqiyya. That is encourages taqiyya. And so what answers do you give to that? Because there are some non-Muslims who may not actually deliberately be believing this, but because they have been fed with this, and they want to know, they are making research because they are fed up with Christianity, but they want to see the truth of Islam. And so they raise such questions. So what you do is not to dismiss them. If you do not know, you take the question to those who may know, so that they are provided answers. Do we understand? So in this case, the Sahaba, some of them, this thought occurred to them. And because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alim al ghaybi Allam al ghuyub Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what we think even before we utter our thoughts. Allah knew that they were thinking like that. And then he revealed this verse to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. So he said, Verily, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made through his promise. He fulfilled his promise to you. When? At the time that you were having victory over them with the grace by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah permitted, you were having victory over them. You know in the beginning of the battle of Uhud, the non-Muslims were being defeated. You remember that? We mentioned that a few days ago. The non-Muslims were being defeated. The story turned around when some Muslims disobeyed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So Uhud, Rasul alayhi salatu was salam, was in the battle of Uhud and he left these people, you, you know that story, he left these people and said you stay here and distract the attention of the far that may come from behind us so that they cannot come from behind us while we are facing these ones in front. And Rasul alayhi salatu was salam was in that battle himself. So, but while he was fast, uh, fi fighting, they had almost defeated, in fact, they had defeated the kuffar. The ones that they faced, they had defeated those ones. And the battle was almost theirs. But the problem came when these ones that were kept here moved. Abdullah ibn Jubair and a few of them did not move, but they were not enough to counter this attack that had come from behind. And so they were defeated. And that battle was bloody, and many Uffaz and many prominent Muslims were killed in that battle, one of them being Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. That was one death that uh, cost Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam a lot of pain. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when you were killing them, if tahusunahum bi idni, أي تقتلونهم قتلا ذريعا بقضاء الله. You were killing them in multitudes and their numbers with the permission of Allah سبحانه وتعالى. حتى إذا فشل. Until such a time that you weakened. Until such a time that you weakened and there was now the wish amongst you. Some people said we will go and take that booty because the war has been won. Some people said no. The Prophet said we should remain here, so let's remain here. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Hatta iza fashiltum, ay jabuntum, until you weakened. Wa qila ma'anahu, falamma fashiltum, watanaza'tum. When you weakened, you now were split. And you now disagreed with each other, and you were in conflict. This person said this, this other person said that. You disagreed without scripture. You had no evidence to disagree. Tanazo comes, Faiza Waiza Faiza Tanazatum Filamri. 
let's 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 um, talk about the other verse first. Wa inta nazaatum fi shayin, wa inta nazaatum fi shayin, farudhu illa Allahi, ha? Wa Rasul. Ida tanazaatum. When you disagree, it means that the tanazul happens concerning that issue that one party is not referring to the sunnah. One party is not referring to the Quran. So Allah says, return the issue to the Quran and sunnah. That means one party is not returning to the Quran and sunnah. Those who said, there is Ghanima will go and take theirs, ours. Were they referring to any verse of the Quran? Were they referring to any hadith of Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam? No. They were disobeying Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam. Each time you do that amongst you, a party of you disobeys the sunnah. A party of you goes out of the dictates of the sunnah, there will be trouble amongst you. The non-Muslims will defeat you. You will never have victory when you do that. And the reign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not be practiced as it should be practiced when Muslims do that. All the time we should always return to the Quran and Sunnah. If you have a view that differs from the view of the old person, one of you is not practicing the Sunnah. So go back to the Sunnah and see what it says. Only the Sunnah will re uh, unite you, will reunite you. When people say, let's unite, let's forget our differences, no, that is where you will never unite. When you say, let's forget our differences, that's where you have left the truth. Huh? These are our differences we should not forget. We should know we have differences, and then we should search for where the differences came, so that we will solve the problem. Let me give you a short story. There was somebody who was traveling to Saudi and in his bag, when he went to the airport, you know, before you cross a particular place, there will be a door, and then you put your luggage this way. There is a sensor and all that. They, they, they scan whatever you have in your bags. You go through this door, and if your bag is safe, you pick it the other place. But then if you hear a sound, then it means there is an alarm that has been raised. So the owner of the bag will not be allowed to proceed. The bag will be brought down and checked. So his bag made a sound. I mean, the, the, the computer sounded. And so they brought down his bag. And he tied the bag with some ropes. He covered the, the bag with a sack. And then he tied the sack with ropes. So they removed the ropes and uh, kept them one side and searched the bag. When they finished searching the bag, there was nothing in it, nothing incriminating in the bag. So they, they asked him to tie, tie back the bag, which he did, and then they put the bag back, and then it made that sound again, about two, three times. So they said, my brother, please don't punish us. We know there must be something in this bag but we can't see it. Please show us what it is. We will not arrest you. He said, promise me in the name of Allah that you will not arrest me. They said, Wallahi, we will not arrest you. So because he knows them, Wallahi means a lot to them. So he agreed. But if it's here, you hear, Wallahi, it's Allah, Allah, don't agree. <laughs> or it's here, here, inshallah. <laughs> Huh? Say, yeah, inshallah. Come on, go away. I've, I've heard it so many times. And before the war, or even immediately after the war, if you say, inshallah, in Potakot or in whatever, whatever, you say, inshallah, they say it's done. If how someone say, inshallah, you know it, he will do it. Or how someone say, wallahi, he will never, if he says, wallahi, I will not do this thing, he will never do it. If he tells you, Wallahi, that is how it is, then believe it. They used to believe completely then, no longer now. Say, Wallahi, say, maybe it's lie, he said, not lie. And <laughs> it's unfortunate, but that's how it is. 
So they said, Wallahi, he agreed. So he said, they should uh, open the bag. So they loosened the ropes, and then they threw the ropes away. He said, that is where the, your mistake is. When you are searching for the incriminating thing, it is in that rope, and you keep throwing the rope away. So when you have thrown the rope away, how can you find it? He has had drugs, but they are in that rope. So when he loosens the twines, as he untwines one, you see, you see cocaine falling. Before they knew it, there was much cocaine there, gathered, that he had put in between the twines. So what am I saying? If you say, let's forget our differences, then you can never have a common ground. Don't throw away the differences. Bring the differences to table. You understand? And discuss them. There you will find your solution. Put them on a scale, and that is the scale of the Quran and Sunnah. Do we understand? But what happened to those Sahaba is that some had seen something they, had, they were attracted to, but some were always remembering the fact that they had the instruction of Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam. The Prophet had instructed them not to move from here, and they should have kept to the instruction. But some thought, no, there was no need since this and that have happened. This is the mistake that our fuqaha make in their fiqh. They know that there is this instruction, but they say, since there is this and that, there is no need for it again. For instance, they say there is something they call maqasid al-sharia. Some people become ahlul bid'ah because maqasid al-sharia, that they have formed themselves. They keep forgetting that this is their thinking. And so the thinking should have limit. They keep forgetting that. They say, for instance, that Bilal used to leave the mosque. He used to do his adhan outside the mosque. He used to stand by the door of the mosque to do the adhan. They say, but that was because in, at that time there were no loudspeakers. There was no this and that. But now we have everything. So we can, we can just uh, call from inside the mosque. So they no longer leave the mosque. It is written in the books of Sunnah that Bilal used to go out. It's ibadah. It's an act of ibadah. And Bilal used to go out. Was it not the instruction of Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam? Why don't you think like that? Why don't you say it must have been an instruction of Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam that you go outside to call the, the prayer and you stand by the door? For instance, why doesn't that occur to you? Why is it that what occurs to you is that it was because there were no loudspeakers? Why do you have the second thought? Why not the first one? Because the Sahaba were always acting on the instructions of Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam. But you see, they don't, uh, some of them do not think like that. They say, I am the Sharia, the aim of the Sharia. Why was this thing uh, brought because of this and that. Who told you that? Who told you that the reason is that it's only that so that people will hear? Who told that? Who told you they had no way of uh, talking from inside and getting people outside to hear? If that was the case, they could be inside the mosque and blow on, that they started blowing and people would hear. But if you say it's because you want people to hear, Go out now without the loudspeaker and call the prayer and see if the people of your area will hear. Will they hear? Huh? Why? If they could hear that of Bilal, why wouldn't they hear their own? Why do you have to use the loudspeaker even when you're outside? So the aim is just sunnah. Go out there, stand by the door, imitate Bilal as he did because it's sunnah taqririya because Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam saw that and didn't say no you don't have to come out and so it's a sunnah and you'll be rewarded for it if you emulate him my brothers and sisters in Islam this is salafiyya 
we stand exactly where the salaf stood and we do not use our logic to leave where they stood. Or we don't say, okay, this is our generation, it's different from that, so blah, blah, blah. No. Stand where they stood. If it is acts of ibadah. There is blessing in everything that they did. If it is acts of ibadah. I hope you are understanding this. So this is where tanazo comes. Hatta idha fashiltum wa tanazaatum fi amri wa asaytum. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the time that you refuse to obey and every person went his way, then there was another amongst you. There was this agreement amongst you and then you became disunited. وَأَسَيْتُمْ And therefore you, offend, you, you sinned against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you disagree, Without proof from the Quran and Sunnah, then of course you will sin against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you sin against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah could destroy you as a result of that. So, the Muslims were victorious. That's what Allah is telling them. You were victorious. It was your sin that cost you the defeat that you later um, suffered. But in the beginning when you were obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you were victorious. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you victory. Huh? Ya'ni, asaytum al-rasoola, alayhi salatu wasalam, you offended the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by doing what? By disagreeing with him. By doing the contrary of what he had commanded you to do. So each time you do that, this is what happens to you. Any time you refuse to cling to his ruling, you lose your iman. You lose part of your iman. And then of course you become sinners. Is that? Huh? After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had shown you, had given you what you wanted, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made you see what you wanted. That is defeat, uh, um, victory that you wanted, you had gotten it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed you victory and showed you the ganima that you were going to have, but you were impatient. That is the problem. You were impatient. There were some of you whose main desire was the thing of this world. And so when they saw the Ganima, they couldn't wait. When they saw the spoils, they couldn't wait. When they saw the booty, they couldn't wait. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about those who left where they were told to stay. The place they were told to stay, they left the place and went for the things that they had, they had seen. وَمِنْكُمْ مَنْ يُرِيدُ الْآخِرَةِ But amongst you there are those whose desire was the life of the hereafter. The reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. يَعْنِي الَّذِينَ ثَبَتُوا مَا عَبْدِ اللَّهِ بْنِ جُبَيْرِ حَتَّى قُتِلُوا Allah is talking about those who stayed where Rasulullah had told them to stay along with Abdullah ibn Jubair until they were killed those ones it was Al-Jannah that desired <clears throat> Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said that Wallahi it never occurred to me that there were people amongst the Sahaba that were more concerned about the dunya, that, that had this law of the things of this world in his heart until this ayah was revealed. Before this ayah was revealed, said Wallahi, I did not, I wouldn't have believed that there were people like that. But then it happened. They are human beings. 
and so some of them must make mistakes. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثم صرفكم عنهم, right? Huh? I ردكم عنهم, but after all that had happened, at the time that they wanted to come back and finish you completely, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turned them back. لِيَبْتَلِيَكُمْ Allah did all of this. The defeat that you suffered. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did all of that and everything that happened to test you. To test you. Test you with what? Test you with the bala that followed. The defeat that followed all of what happened. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed those people to do that thing. To, to disobey Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam. Even though it's not right, he allowed it to happen because he wanted to use that to test the Muslims. But then, this is why I said we must... Allah says, but who of you who failed to wait and acted contrary to the instructions of Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam, Allah has forgiven you. Those of you who waited and were killed, those ones, of course, they have gotten the shahada. Verily, Allah has forgiven you. The kind of forgiveness is but it will not be written on their slates on the day of resurrection. So when they are resurrected, that offense they committed will not be mentioned. That offense they committed will not be mentioned. Allah has forgiven them because of the efforts they had made in their lives. So, the good deeds that you're doing now, try to do them as well as you can. Even if you have offenses, even if you have sins, Wallahi, Allah could look at the little efforts you have made, and because of them, He will say, I forgive all the other mistakes you have made. Try as much as possible, no matter how little, to get some acts together which are feasibilillah, which you did with us and you did in accordance with the sunnah of Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam. Try to hold on to them and do them as much as you can. No matter how little they are, wallahi, they could be the reason why Allah will say, I've forgiven you all other mistakes because of this little thing that you did. You looked at it as little, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appreciates it a lot. We understand. So whatever you do, do not belittle it. If it's an act of ibadah, even if you're in the mosque, and you see some dirt on the carpet, you pick that dirt, you take it out and throw it in the dustbin. Wallahi, for this alone, for this alone, Allah could forgive some mistakes you made in your salah. Allah could even forgive the fornication that you committed at a time. Even if it's riyazan billah. You committed adultery, you, commi you fornicated, you stole, you did this, you did that. You ask Allah's forgiveness. For these little things you do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could wipe those things off your mizan. And all that you will have will be the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show us His mercy. So, those who insult the Sahaba, for some of the mistakes they have made, this ayah, amongst many other ayat, are proofs that the Sahaba do not need to be insulted over that because Allah has forgiven them for the efforts that they have made. So what is your own? Don't you want Allah's forgiveness too? Why not concentrate on your own mistakes and seek Allah's forgiveness concerning them rather than dwell on somebody else when Allah has already forgiven that person? May Allah forgive us all. We still have time, don't we? Go ahead. Huh? Wallahu zu fadlin ala al mu'minin. Yes, go ahead. We finish this. We have. So Allah's Allah's fadl on Allah's bounties on the mu'minun is great. Allah subhanahu wa taala always is bountiful in His dealings with the mu'minun. Naam, go ahead. إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ يَدْعُو إِلَى عَذَابِ 
نعم الله سبحانه وتعالى says إذ تسعدون ولا تلوون على أحد والرسول يدعوك في أخراكم فأثبكم وات غم بغم إذ تسعدون ولا تلوون على أحد والرسول يدعوكم في أخراكم فأثابكم غما بغم لكي لا لكي لا تحزنوا على ما فاتكم ولا ما فاه خير بما تعملون الله سبحانه وتعالى says إذ تسعدون يعني لقد عفى عنكم إذ تسعدون هاربين أي تسعدون حدا الله سبحانه وتعالى says at at that time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven you. He forgave you at the time that you were ascending the hills and fighting. The time you were fighting in Uhud and you were ascending. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave you even at that time. Abu Abdul Rahman al-Sulami al-Hasan wa Qatada read it as tas'aduna tas'aduna instead of tus'iduna the fath ta'i wal ayn but this qira'a is shadha and so is not used you can't uh, recite this when you are uh, saying observing salah you understand you can't use it like that but qira'atu al ma'rufatu bi dhamm ta tus'iduna Okay, wa kasri al-ayn, tus'iduna. Wal is'ad al-sayru fi mustawa al-ard. So they were ascending. At the time they were ascending to fight in Uhud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already forgiven them at that time. Do we understand? Wa la talwuna ala ahadin. Ay, la ta'arujuna wa la tuqimuna ala uhudin. So that this is what Allah is talking about. That they were sending to fight is actually dissension. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided to use the opposite. He's explaining the matter. So Allah says that you were ascending, but actually meaning that you were going towards the enemies. But the actual thing was that they were descending, not ascending. He calls it ascension because it's a move towards the enemy. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you were not remaining where Allah uh, Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam had asked you to remain you did not remain where Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam had asked you to remain so you were turning and looking at each other because you were obeying disobeying the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam those who were down were supposed to be concentrating on the battle but you were turning to look at some of you were turning to look at the the Ghanima. Those of you who were up were eyeing what was before them, and so they were also descending, they were coming down uh, to get that. But then even as you were doing that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had forgiven you. Because you had come for the battle for the sake of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at hearts. In your heart, you wanted to defend the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for that alone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with you. So the fact that you disobeyed Allah later will not erase the fact that in the first place you got into the act for the sake of Allah. And Allah has looked at that and has forgiven you. So the mistakes you'll make later will not be as important as the good intentions that you had in the beginning. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, we don't forget the good that people have done because they later made mistakes. I'm saying this for the umpteenth time this tafsir. 
We don't forget the good things that people have done because they made mistakes sometime later in their lives. We should look at their beginning and look at their lives and the contributions they have made unless they have completely committed apostasy. The fact that they had made a mistake or two should not should not at all overshadow our sight from the good things that they have been known to do in their lives. And of course, looking at the possibility that they could do some more good things later. Do we understand this? Allah is Al-Rahman. Al we should also be like that to fellow humans, to fellow Muslims. We should always accept excuses from people. And even when we get angry with people, we should always remember that there are good things about them. So even as we're punishing them for getting wrong, we should not exceed our limit as we remember the good for what he had done. Even when uh, Al Ghamidiyah, even when she was uh, executed or she had committed, may Allah uh, radiallahu ta'ala had done all of that. Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam says, Allah has forgiven them with the forgiveness that it, if it was shared between the Sahaba, it would have sufficed for all of them. And so they never disrespected them again after that. Forgiving them. So if you do not give them, who are you? How useful will, will be your own, uh, your, 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 the, 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 your disposition? It's not useful because it's Allah they worship and Allah has already forgiven them. You worship Allah. It's Allah's forgiveness that you want. So continue to seek Allah's forgiveness and leave the matter of the people that Allah has already forgiven. Do you understand? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has warned us concerning the Sahaba, concerning if the prophets and people that have passed before us. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about, say about them? لَهَا مَا كَسَبَتُ وَلَكُمْ مَا كَسَبْتُمْ وَلَا تُسْأَلُونَ أَمَّا كَانُوا يَفْعَلُونَ What's the beginning? Tirka ummatun qad khalat laha ma kasabat wa lakum ma kasabtum Those people have passed before you. Whatever they did for which they deserve rewards, Allah will give them the rewards. Their forgiveness Allah has granted them. Wa lakum ma kasabtum Whatever you do for reward Allah will give you yours. Wa la tus'aluna amma kanu ya'malun what they did, Allah will not ask you concerning that. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already forgiven them. So do not worry yourself about this. Worry yourself over yours. How will your own end be? Do we understand? وَالرَّسُولُ يَدْعُوكُمْ فِي أُخْرَاكُمْ أَيْ فِي آخِرِكُمْ وَمِنْ وَرَائِكُمْ إِلَيَّ عِبَادُ اللَّهِ فَأَنَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ So Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam was calling you and telling you that from behind you, the last of you, Allah, Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam was calling you. Obey me, obey me, O servants of Allah. I am the messenger of Allah. Come to me and stop going to that thing that you're pursuing. I told you to stay where you are, please stay. Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam was saying, whoever obeys me, Allah will give him Jannah. But then, you did not listen to him at that time. فَأَثَابَكُمْ أَيْ فَجَزَاكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now rewarded you. فَأَثَابَكُمْ What? غَمَّمْ بِغَمِّمْ He rewarded you with a sadness after sadness. With a loss after loss. With a disgrace after disgrace. Because you had obeyed, disobeyed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from all of that. So many people, many, many, many people were killed as a result of this. As a result of what had happened, the kuffar came and killed the, uh, the sahaba of Rasul alayhi salatu wa salam. Even Rasul alayhi salatu was was injured in that battle. And what happened happened. لِكَيْ لَا تَحْزَنُوا Right? Huh? لِكَيْ لَا تَحْزَنُوا عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first of all forgave you. So whatever has happened, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven you. Even at the time that you were doing all of that. So that you will not continue to be sad concerning that which has already gone. You understand? Already passed you min al fathi wal ghanima. That you lost the ghanima, you lost the fathi, you, you weren't successful and all that. Do not worry over that. Walama asabukum. And you will also not continue to worry about the defeat that you suffered. Do not continue to worry yourself over that. Wallahu khairun, wallahu khabir bim ta'amalun. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, is informed, well informed of all that you do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also tell. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is well uh, knowledgeable. He knows all that you have done. He knows all that has happened to you. And of course the ones that he should relate, he wills to relate, he will relate. The ones that he wills that he will forgive, he will com completely wipe them off. This one Allah will not relate again because he says, لَقَدْ أَفَّ أَنْكُمْ أَفَّ اللَّهُ أَنْكُمْ Allah has already forgiven you this and he has written it, it off your mizan so he will never mention it again. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala write off all our sins so that when we stand before him, none of them will be counted again except our good deeds. May Allah correct the mistakes we, we make on this earth so that we do not go to the akhirah with them. We and our parents and our children and our generations and all those who follow uh, the straight path. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala place us on it. I think this is uh, how far we can go today. Inshallah ta'ala will stop here. And uh, if there are questions that have been written today, we'll answer them. If there are no questions, we'll close because I will not answer the old ones. This one is your take on to perform nafila. It's permissible. Don't ask my take. What is the ruling of the Sharia? What is the ruling of the Sharia? Not my take. What will you do with my take? Huh? You know, I know students of knowledge who make that mistake in that town. Very many of them. If they meet you, they say, what is your own opinion on so and so? That means you have your own opinion. Why not hold on to your own opinion and leave my own opinion? Because Allah will not ask you my own opinion on the day of resurrection. Why don't you just simply agree that you don't know and ask to know? Rather than just want to show that you already have your opinion but you want to know mine. <laughs> you come and say, what is your own opinion on so-so matter? I say, okay, hold on to your opinion and leave my opinion to me. If you already have an opinion, why do, why do you want to know my own? Simply, what is the ruling of the Sharia on this? Aisha radiallahu anha had a slave whom, uh, behind whom she prayed uh, the nafila, the uh, Salatul Layl. And she used to allow him use the mushaf because he was not a hafid. So from there, inshallah ta'ala, we get that it is permissible to use the mushaf to pray if you are not a hafid and you want to read uh, some part of the Quran that you have not memorized. It's permissible, inshallah ta'ala. This one, the question is, well, um, Will the reporting people that castigate or defame me be classified as reporting? I don't understand this question. Bring another question. Uh, what is the ruling on uh, a married woman that left her husband's house for more than a year without any reason and now she is insisting on coming back. If he wants to take her back, he can take her back if he did not divorce her. 
That's all. The marriage is still valid if he has not divorced her. So if he wants her back, he will take her back. If he doesn't want her again, he should divorce her. But of course she has sinned. If she leaves for one hour without his permission, one minute without his permission, one second without his permission, she has against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She shouldn't leave the house without his permission. She has sinned, of course. But what is the way on the marriage? The marriage is still valid if you have not terminated the marriage. What is the Islamic view on a couple who married for a long time without a child and engaged in artificial insemination which later provided them a child? If it is his semen that was used, it is acceptable and the child is his and there is nothing wrong with it. If it is his own man that was used. But if another person's semen was used, this is zina, and that child is not his, is not acceptable in Islam. And that child cannot inherit him, neither can he inherit the child. If it is the second case. But if it is the first one, they me some money to spend on myself for this coming Salah festival. Is it permissible to spend the money on my mother who is in need of money? Of course, why not? Somebody has given you money, he has no right to say how you will use it again. Once he has given you, the money is now yours. Whatever you do with it is not his business. Unless you use it to, to sin against Allah, then he will admonish you, stop doing that. But then the money is now yours. If you use it on your mother, may Allah bless you, that's a very good thing to do. Rather than use it on, are you the one? <laughs> Rather than use it on yourself, you use it on your mother, that's a very good thing to do. May Allah give us all the heart to do that. That even money we need, we give it to our parents, so Allah is a very good thing. May we be able to do that. But I thought you were going to ask if you can use the money on me. <laughs> This one says, Can I perform Maghrib by following the one praying Isha? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And uh, the reason is that nothing in the Sharia stops you from doing so. If you have any reason why you cannot pray behind the person saying Isha, please let me know. I'm not the one that should give you a proof. You should be the one that should give me the reason why I cannot pray behind somebody saying Isha. If I'm praying Maghrib. You have no reason at all. The Prophet has never said that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that if you're praying Maghrib, you should not pray behind the person praying Isha. The Prophet didn't say so. Allah didn't say so. Allah says, wa salata wa atu zakata wa this is what Allah says. If I see people praying, I pray behind them. If you say, if I'm praying Maghrib, I cannot follow the one praying Isha, give me your reason. You are the one who should give me your reason. I hope you are satisfied. This one says, is there any sin in collecting food from a Muslim sister in the month of Ramadan, how did you get her to collect food from her? How did you get food from her? A sister that you are dating, how did she get to give you the food? Answer my question before I answer yours. Allahumma qasim lana min khashiyati kama ta'ulu bihi baynana wa bayna ma'asiyatik. ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا بها جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقواتنا أبدا ما أبقيتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا وانصرنا على من عادانا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا برهمنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا ولا تسلط عنا بذنوبنا من لا يخافك فينا ولا يحمنا سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد 
كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته